choose your cup. Come on now, don't be bashful. <laughs> Brother Brian, you're number, uh, you're number one. Myron, I'm sorry. Brother Myron. I'm Myron Powell. I'm director of the mission in the Philippines. Hey, amen. It's good to have you. Brother Dick. Wade Alton, Southside Baptist Church, Salem, Virginia.
nervous again. <laughs> Brother Dean had me a microphone a moment ago. I got really nervous, you know. And uh, I do appreciate all the music tonight. Great to see you. I love being in this meeting and uh, always grateful for the fellowship. I love Pastor Collins and his wife. These are happy Christians. Amen. And uh, they've been serving the Lord a long time and they've kept the joy of Jesus and I admire that. And uh, I appreciate this church hosting us and uh, several of you preachers being here tonight bringing folks. It's a real encouragement. I mean that. I have to say, this was a first for me tonight, Pastor. I, I've seen some pastors and piano players get into arguments, but I've never seen them on the platform of the church. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first tonight. And uh, I'm just glad that she was humble enough to let you win here. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Have a good time in the Lord. Let's open the Word of God tonight. Would you open your Bible with me to the Gospel according to John? And I want to bring it tonight to a familiar text. You know, the problem with familiar text is they're familiar text. And sometimes we breeze over them, but I've been meditating on this beautiful story, powerful story in John chapter 2 the last couple of days. And I want to study it with you tonight. I have a dear friend in Canada writes to me with regularity, and he always closes his emails the same way. He always closes with this statement. Walk by Calvary every day. That's pretty good. Isn't it? Yeah. I think that's good advice for all of us. Yeah. Matter of fact, why don't you tell the person next to you to walk by Calvary every day? Would you please just tell them? Right good. You know what I've discovered? Most of us most of us walk by certain places every day, but few of us walk by Calvary every day. How many of you walk past the refrigerator at least once every day? <laughs> How many of you walk past the television with the news on at least once every day? The truth of the matter is, if we walked by Calvary every day, it would help our hearts. It would do something for us. And the best way I'm going to do that is I have tried to make a practice, especially of late, that I'm reading something from the gospel records every day. And I will recommend that to you. Wherever you are in your Bible reading, whatever pattern you follow, if you read something from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John every day of your life, it will make you think about Jesus. Amen. And I think that's, that's something that would be really good for all of us right now, because if you're not careful, uh, the world will get big in front of you, and the problems will get big in front of you, and your emotions will get big in front of you, and Jesus will stay real small. You know? But if you get Jesus real big in your thinking, everything else gets small. So I'm going through John right now. It's been good for me. And the other day, I opened my Bible to John 2, and I read this story, and I've read it how many times? But it, it helped my heart. Would you let me just share what helped my heart tonight? Look at John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Where the Bible says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Paul's let your head look at me just a moment. Let me clear up two misconceptions. The first is, it's my conviction that Jesus did not turn water into alcohol. <laughs> Somebody said, it was wine? Yes, but you have to understand the Eastern custom and the ancient custom of the wines in Bible days, there was alcoholic wine, but there was also fruit of the vine that was not fermented. And I don't believe that the same God who said wines and water strong drink is raging, who swear was deceived thereby is not wise, but have made a bunch of booze and passed it out of the marriage. Now, if you want to believe something else, you could be wrong if you want to, but I don't believe Jesus made alcohol. That's not my message tonight. That one's extra, all right? But if you want to argue about it, I'm not going to argue about it. I just believe God is a consistent God. And it's inconsistent for us to interpret it any other way. Right. Now that being said, the other thing that I think sometimes we miss, when you look at Jesus' response to his mother in verse 4, and he says, woman, how many of you know if you called your mom a woman, it wouldn't have been good? <laughs> you know, in our part of the world where we grow up, mama, good. Mother, fine. Mom, okay. But if I looked my mother in the face and said, woman, it would have been the last word that ever came out of my mouth. When Jesus said woman, it was a term of honor and respect in the world they were in. And I love the fact that to the very end of our Lord's life, he honored his mother. Yeah. Think of this. Hanging on the cross. How 
many of you think he had a lot on his mind on the cross? <laughs> Hanging on the cross, he took care of his mother. And he used the same word. Do you remember the word? Woman, behold thy son. Behold thy mother. Keep reading, verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's a pretty good motto, isn't it? And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. For when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, don't you love God's parenthesis? Even God's parenthesis is inspired. But the servants which drew the water knew. Yeah. Would you pause just a moment? May I just give a little side note here? And it is this. The only people that really understand what God is doing are the ones who are participating in the work. Yeah. And if you want to see God's mighty power, my recommendation is get off the sidelines. Get off the bench and get in the game. The Lord is still looking for servants and participants. And when you get involved in the work of the Lord, laborers together with God, guess what you see? You see Jesus at work. Yeah. The servants which drew the water anew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, verse 10, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk them that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. May I just point out to you, it had nothing to do with the governor. It had everything to do with the governor. Amen. The governor of the feast had nothing to do with this. Matter of fact, that sorry bum ran out before the party was done. No, no. The governor, capital G, I'm talking about the king. Yeah. The master, he's the one who took care of all this. This wasn't man's doing. This was the Lord's doing. And notice verse 11. In fact, read verse 11 aloud with you, would you, church? This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And we're again the text that records for us the first miracle, recorded miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. I was looking at a list today, a chronological list that someone put together of the miracles of Jesus. And not for this meeting, I'm, I'm hoping in the next a month or two, when we finish the series we're in on our daily podcast, I'm just praying about it. I think we're going to study through all the miracles of Jesus. And I said to somebody today, I want to study through them. I need it, frankly, but I want to study through it because I think it might be good for all of us in the midst of the mess we're in right now just to be reminded that our God is still a miracle-working God. Amen. There's no doubt about it. Somebody says, you still believe God works miracles? You better believe it. You may not recognize all of them. And they may not all be exactly like the ones he was performing when he was walking this planet, but I believe all power is still in our God's hands. And it does my faith good to know that whatever's going on in the world, Christ is more than he does. Amen. Let's start with the bookends tonight. Can we start with the bookends? In verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 11, John, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us a number of little facts about the setting for the story, the, the context of the text. And I want to just remind you that nothing in the Bible is there by accident. Amen. You all believe everything in the Bible is there for a reason? Amen. Nothing incidental, nothing accidental, nothing coincidental. No, the good prophets of God told us every word of this. So let's start. Look at verse number one. The Bible first tells us when the miracle happened. The Bible says it happened on the third day. Isn't that interesting? Can I just point out to you that Christ did a lot of his best work on the third day? In fact, the greatest miracle he ever performed was not even raising other dead people. It was him raising himself from the dead. The greatest miracle of all was the last one, and that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that happened on the third day. Praise God, the Lord is always right on time. So the third day is a reminder this is God's miracle day. Keep reading. He tells us not only when it happened, what was that? The third day, there was a what? Yeah. Marriage. How many married people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? How many of you are still glad to be married? Good. Well, trying to give you gentlemen an opportunity, fellas. You really ought to take it. <laughs> My wife and I just celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary and working towards 25. And 
Uh, we got married on Friday the 13th. It was the luckiest Friday the 13th of my life. It was wonderful. And I remember it. Now our oldest daughter is getting ready to get married in January. Would y'all pray for me, please? <laughs> I've been praying a lot recently. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I think her fiance is praying the other way. But anyhow, uh, we're, we're planning a wedding. We're working towards a wedding. And isn't it beautiful that the very first miracle Jesus ever performed took place at a wedding ceremony, at a marriage? Look, who came up with family? Who, who put Adam and Eve together in the garden for the first time? This was all God's idea. And so our Lord, watch this, is connecting his miracle power to our homes. Oh, I love that. See, people expect to see God show up in the church house. I'll just tell you, God was here before we showed up. And the Lord is always at work. But I, I submit to you, dear friends, God doesn't just want to work at the church house. God wants to work in your house. And perhaps some of you right now are dealing with something in your family. You need God to intervene. I want to remind you, the Lord shows up in families. And when he shows up, he always does his best work there. He breathes. He not only tells us when it happened and what was going on, he tells us where it happened. It wasn't just a marriage, and it wasn't just a marriage anywhere. A lot of Jewish wedding ceremonies taking place at this time, I'm sure. But this was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Somebody says, well, that's just geographical information. No, it's not. I want you to back up to chapter 1 for just a moment. I'll remind you that chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. When God gave his word, he didn't give it in chapter and verse divisions. For the record, I'm glad we have them, or we'd all still be looking for the text tonight. But you've got to read through it all the time to get the full story. At the end of John chapter number 1, Jesus met a man. Actually, a man met Jesus. Jesus already knew him. And the Lord changed him. His name was Nathaniel. You better remember Nathaniel? Nathaniel was the one that said, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Oh, yes. Come and see. Not just good things come out of Nazareth. God came through that. So he meets the Lord. The Lord exceeds all expectations like he always does. And Nathaniel confesses him as Messiah. And look at verse number 50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? In other words, he said, You're pretty easily impressed with that. Just because I, I saw you before you saw me, just because I knew you by name, just because I knew what you were thinking, you're impressed by that, I'm God. I, I'm going to do more than that. Look at the end of verse 50. Thou shalt see, what does he say? Greater things than these. Then he says to him in verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending of all the Son of Man. He says, I'm not just going to show you earthly things, I'm going to show you heavenly things. I'm not just going to show you men, I'm going to show you the power of God. And by the way, that was fulfilled because Nathaniel was one of them that was in the boat with Simon Peter when the risen Christ showed up on the shoreline and fixed breakfast for all of them. Nathaniel was there on the morning that they saw the risen Son of God. Christ always keeps his word. Yeah, right. I want to show you a little nugget. I want you to circle, please, in verse number 50, the words greater things. Oh, we have a God of greater things. Yeah. And I want you to draw a line from the greater things of chapter 1 to Cana of Galilee in chapter 2. And notice the divine order. God is a God of order. He says to Nathaniel, I'm going to show you greater things than these. And then it's almost like he takes him by the hand and leads him, remember all the disciples are with him, to the marriage in Cana of Galilee. Somebody says, what's the significance of that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Would you like to guess where Nathaniel's from? <coughs> As a matter of fact, it is John, at the end of John's Gospel record, John chapter 20, I believe it is, that refers to the same man found in John chapter 1, Nathaniel, as this. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. And I got to think that when Nathaniel met Messiah, he had in his mind, well, now Messiah's going to help us march on Rome. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm going to show you greater things, Nathaniel. And I'll tell you where we're going to start. We're going to start in your hometown. We're not going to charge the government. I'm going to take you back to the most mundane, ordinary, nominal, run-of-the-mill place, the place where you grow up and you think everybody knows you and you know everybody and you know everything about it, and I'm going to prove to you in ordinary circumstances that I have an extraordinary God. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to take you to something that seems so natural to you and demonstrate the supernatural power of God to you. Listen to me, church. I am convinced that we're sitting around waiting on God to do something in some big place somewhere and the Lord wants to meet us right where we live and labor and show His power in our Cana of Galilee. Amen. So the Lord's first miracle. He tells us, look back in chapter 2, when it happened, what it was, where it was, and then he tells us who was there. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Would you mark mother and disciples? As a matter of fact, you're going to discover in a moment, Mama was actually one of the disciples. She wasn't one of the original apostles, that's not what I mean. But she was truly a follower of her own son by this point. She had entered into a different relationship with him. He wasn't just her son. He was now her savior. Read that in Luke chapter 2. She said, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit doth rejoice in God my savior. Wow. If you want to know why I don't worship Mary, it's because Mary worshiped Jesus. And I figure if that was good enough for Mary, it's good enough for the rest of us. See, she's become a disciple. But don't miss this, please. Who was it that got to witness the first miracle? Who was it that got to see the Lord Jesus give a little glimpse of his glory and power in Canaan of Galilee? It was those who were willing to stay close to him. We live in a world that wants to see a sign. Show us something, preacher. Go ahead. Prove to us who your God is. I want you to know that you're not going to see God's glory from a distance. If you want to see God work, you better get as close to Jesus as you possibly can. And dear church, this is not the generation nor the time in our nation for you to be drifting from God. This is the moment to get as close to Christ as you possibly can, near to the heart of God. And then at the end of the story, in verse 11, he tells us why he performs the miracle. Why does he perform it? Two reasons. Verse number 11, he manifested forth his glory, number one. And, number two, his disciples believed on him. There's a beautiful order here. He, he reveals himself, and their response is a response of faith. Watch this, please. Jesus didn't perform miracles so he could show off. Jesus performed miracles so he could show people who he was. In fact, I hear people say, Jesus had a healing ministry. No, he didn't. Jesus didn't have a healing ministry. He had a revealing ministry. Every miracle had a message. And every powerful thing he did had a purpose. All of it was for one reason. And that was so people would know him. Amen. If he had a healing ministry, I would ask you, why didn't he heal everybody? Right. If his purpose was just to perform miracles, if that was the goal and not the means to the end, then why didn't he go everywhere and do everything he could for everybody on earth? And the answer was, he was doing it for one reason, just to give them a little glimpse of his glory. Right. And then notice, please, the second purpose, it was that they would believe on it. Now, I just tell you, God doesn't work in our lives, so our lives will be just a little bit better. Yeah. I'm so sick of hearing people say, well, if, I, if things just improve just a little bit, listen to me, church. Jesus doesn't want your life just to be a little bit better. He wants it to be radically different. He doesn't want you just to ease through life and be comfortable. No, no. He wants you to believe on him and live the life of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But all those are pretty privileged. Because the great emphasis is in the message, in the story itself. I'm speaking tonight on this subject. Would you write it down somewhere, maybe in the margin of your Bible? Or on the back of that little bulletin that they gave you coming in. Write this down somewhere across the top of your paper. What God brings out of nothing. We have this idea that if we get everything figured out, we can see God. Or if we can get something fixed, then, then we can see God. I want to say to you, God doesn't work when you get it all figured out. And God doesn't work when you get something fixed. God works right in the middle of your nothing. In fact, I would ask you, what did Mary contribute to this? What did the disciples bring to the wedding? Pray tell me, please, uh, what, what the servants contributed other than simply following his instructions. It was all the mighty power of God. Could it be? Could it be that God has allowed so many things to break loose in our world at this moment? 
pardon me, and knock the props out from under us. So that we'd stop leaning on ourselves and leaning on one another, excuse me, and leaning on the government and leaning on people that say they have the answer and leaning on our prosperity to remind us that He is God and we are not. Amen. No, I, I say to you tonight, God has always worked out of nothing. And we get the idea that somehow we merit His work, we miss the point. When, when sometimes we think we contribute something, we, we miss the point entirely. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, how did it all begin? In the beginning, God what? Created. May I ask you, what did He create it out of? That's good. Just a whole lot of nothing. Matter of fact, God is very careful to tell us that the earth was without form and void. That's empty. And darkness was upon the face of the earth. Every time I read that, it encourages me. Look, a world of chaos, emptiness, and darkness. That sounds like the world we're living in right now. And out of the chaos, God brought order. And out of the emptiness, God brought fullness. And out of the darkness, God spoke light. May I say here tonight in a world filled with chaos, emptiness, and darkness, God is still God. God is where He's always been. Seated on the throne of the universe. And God can bring much good out of the whole lot of man. In fact, the Hebrew word that was used for created, literally, hurrah, literally means to bring something out of nothing. Did you know? Did you know it's the exact same word David used in his prayer in Psalm 51? Remember David's sin with Bathsheba? Then he murdered a man. He lied to cover it up. Do you remember all of that? When David finally got right with God in Psalm 51, he prayed quite a prayer. I woke up the other morning and had this verse on my mind. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Did you know that David used the exact same word for a God creating a clean heart in him that is used in Genesis 1-1 for God creating the world out of nothing? What was David saying? The sweet psalmist of Israel said, I don't got a song for this, Lord. You're going to have to deal with a whole lot of nothing here. The king of Israel said, I got no answers and no resources to meet the need, but oh God, if out of nothing, out of my mess, you can create a clean heart, oh God, I'll give you the glory for it. And I want to remind all of us tonight, God's always worked with nothing, and nothing about that has changed. Two years ago, I was preaching at a tent meeting one night, and I was backslidden. Don't look at me so pious. Yeah. Preachers get back to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, we get cold hearts and minds where they shouldn't be and sure. motives out of order. Right. How many of you have ever been backslidden? Just curious. Would you raise your hand? The uh, rest of you are backslidden now, so you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> We've all gotten there from time to time. Drifting from the Lord. You think backslidden means, you know, he's living out in the far country. You can be at the far country at home. Yeah. Yeah. I preached that night. When I finished preaching, how hard really wasn't in that, that terrible thing. Because I knew things just weren't right in my own heart. But when I finished preaching that night, the Lord came on me. Say, explain that. I can't lie. I, I remember, I can take you to the place, I can take you to the location. I remember where I was standing behind a pulpit, looking at the place, old sawdust trail, altars everywhere, people weeping before the Lord, broken before God, people getting saved, and people getting right with the Lord. And here, here the preacher stood behind the pulpit, struggling in my own spirit. The meeting finished, and I got in the car by myself. I, I, I could take you to the place on the road where I was, in the town where I was. And I was just, I don't know, puzzled by it all. And I remember, I said out loud, I mean, nobody in the car but me and Jesus, but I said out loud, Lord, I don't know how on earth you can ask me. And just like that, the Holy Spirit said to me, how do you think I bless you anybody? God started coming to me.
God brings out nothing. Would you like to know? Let me give you three of them tonight. They all come right from our text. Number one, would you write down that he brings blessing out of obedience? You know, everybody wants the product today. Nobody wants the process. Everybody wants to be blessed, preacher. Everybody wants to be blessed. They want their kids blessed, their grandkids blessed, their home blessed, their job blessed. They just don't want to live like they ought to live. And I want to remind you that from the very beginning when God established his covenant with his people in the Old Testament, the little equation, the formula was, if you obey me, I bless you. If you disobey me, then the curse will be upon you. Yeah. And I say to you that God has always connected divine blessing to our obedience. Amen. When we look at John chapter number 2, verse number 4, Jesus says to her, Woman, well, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. <laughs> this has always been humorous to me. His mother saith unto the servants. Did you notice she didn't even answer him? <laughs> I mean, she's mom. She can do what she wants to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jesus just looked his mother in the face and said, My hour has not yet come. She turns away from him to the servants and says, He's getting ready to tell you something. And whatever he tells you, just do that. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Does verse 4 sound promising to you? I'm just curious. Like, do you think, if you had heard Jesus say verse 4, do you think you would have been sitting on like expectancy that Jesus is getting ready to do something? But Mary. See, Mary, Mary had some spiritual insight into all of this. I love this. And you know, remember the old show, Father Knows Best? Well, I've been around long enough to know Mama's had some real insight. And this mother was not just a good mother. She was... She was a spiritual mother. And she's looking at it from a different perspective. And notice, please, what she says in verse 5. Whatsoever he saith unto you. What's the next two words, church? Yeah. I didn't hear you. What are they? Yeah. Do that. May I ask you tonight, what's your whatsoever? What is the thing the Lord's been speaking to you about for years? And you still have done? See, I know who comes to a Tuesday night meeting. By and large, by and large, and we've had people say in these Tuesday night meetings, and that's one of them, but by and large, uh, you've got faithful Christians and committed followers of Christ, and we get the idea, we get the aura that, you know, we've all just obeyed the Lord like we ought to obey the Lord. But let's just get down to where we live, be brutally honest with ourselves and God, who already knows the truth about us for just a moment. And let's confess that there are moments in our life and areas in our life that the Holy Spirit puts His finger on certain things and prompts us about certain things and we hesitate just a little bit and we resist. We say, I'm going to do that. I really am going to do it. I'm just not going to do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> are you an obedient follower of Christ tonight? I'm not asking how long you've been saved. Sometimes people almost can pride themselves on how long they've been in church, how long they've known the Lord, and that kind of thing. Let's cut through all that tonight. Are you an obedient follower of Jesus Christ? Amen. Is there anything in your life right now that shouldn't be there, or anything that should be there that isn't? Is there anything God's told you to do and you've not yet acted on it? You waiting for me to tell you what it is? I don't know you. I, you think I can preach on everything tonight to everybody? Oh, no. Oh, but that's all right. I don't have to because the Holy Spirit's telling you right now. <laughs> like arrows from heaven, shoot, right to the heart. You know, preachers sometimes, we get a little too general, I think, in our preaching. We get kind of almost generic. We say things like, live for Jesus. Somebody says, what does that mean? Well, man, I tell you, the Holy Spirit is never generic or general. He's always very specific. And look, please, there's going to be specific instructions given, and God still speaks, and God still speaks specifically. So what is the thing that God has specifically put his finger on in your life and you've not yet obeyed? I say to you, that's the very thing at this moment you must do if you want the blessing of God. There is no substitute for obedience, and there is no shortcut to the blessing. If you want God to bring good out of nothing, then you, my friend, must obey the Lord right where you are. Right. And we can argue, we can argue, and we can say, this is a little thing. It's just a real tiny thing. It's really not that big of a thing. Hey, nothing small when God says to do it. Nothing is small. So we compare ourselves to one another and say, well, I'm more obedient than she is. God didn't ask that. She's not the standard. Jesus is the standard. Right. Is there anything Jesus has told you to do you've not yet done? I've been in a few meetings in my life. 
where there were people there that got it. I mean, they got it. I don't mean they came to an altar and prayed. I mean, they got it. I was in a meeting one night, and a woman came forward, broken, middle-aged wife and mother, and she said to the church, she said, you all don't know this. She said, but I, I, I've just given the, the idea for years that I was scripturally baptized after I was saved. She said, I was never scripturally baptized after I was saved. And she said, I've lived with that every night going to bed, knowing that I had not obeyed God. The first thing Jesus told a new Christian to do. And she said, I want to be baptized right now. And the pastor said, God bless you, sister. He said, we'll take care of that on the Lord's day. We'll get that baptistry water heated up. She was weeping. She raised her hand. She said, no, sir. She said, I'm not leaving until I get baptized today. <laughs> she said, I don't care if it's freezing cold. I'm not going to bed another night without well, obeying Jesus. You said, what happened? We all sat down. She got baptized in freezing cold ice water. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, that's crazy. That's obedience. Amen. You want to see God do something out of nothing right now? Number one, God always brings blessing out of obedience. Number two, as you write down this, God always brings bounty out of emptiness. He brings his bounty out of emptiness. Look at verse number three. Matter of fact, I'm going to read verse three. When I stop, you say the next word. Everybody ready? Look at it carefully, class. John 2, verse number three. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. That's the word. The little tiny word. See the little two-letter word? No. no. They have how much wine? No. Did they have a little bit? No. No, no. They had how much? No. Zip. Zero. No. Nothing. Somebody said, this is desperate. Well, that's good. That's true. Because that's what God said to That's it. Somebody said, preacher, we're not going to make it all the way there. When you get there, you see the Lord. You know why that is? Because God's not the God of endings. He's the God of beginnings. Yeah. It's not just a miracle. This was the beginning of his miracles. Let me tell you what sin will do. Sin will always lead you to a wall. Boom. You just hit a wall. Jesus, he never leads to a wall. He leads to a door. He just opens it up. I don't know what's on the other side of this. That's a nice area. But there's something over there. See, look, please. The world, the world... Always leads you to a dead end. The Lord leads you to a bridge to the next thing. That's just the way the Lord works. So God brings his bounty out of our emptiness. Oh, they have no wine? It's all right. Jesus says, without me, you can do what? No. Not a little bit. Absolutely what? No. Years ago when I was serving at Crown College, you know, colleges, educational institutions, cash flow in the summertime goes like shoo. Students all go home, and you know, people aren't paying their bills in the summertime. And we had a summer that was particularly difficult. I, I still remember, I remember the year. I remember it was when the economy was struggling so, and you remember the markets died, and people were really having a hard time. We had a gigantic bill due, gigantic bill, gigantic for me, but it was a large electrical bill due that Something had messed up in the building system, and we didn't know about it, what it was, what it was due, and just like that, it came to Large college campus, trying to keep everything going. And God knows we were trying to do the right thing. I was young, and the Lord's work and administration there, and I was helping with some financial things. And I called the pastor. Now, he'd been through a great deal, you know, through the years and hadn't believed God for many things, but it was all new for me. I called the pastor and I said, Pastor, we got a huge bill due tomorrow. He said, how much is it? And I told him. He said, all right. I said, maybe you didn't hear what I said. And so I repeated the amount. <laughs> and I said, it's due tomorrow. I said, he said, all right. I said, Pastor, I, I, maybe we don't have a good connection. I'm trying to figure out how are we going to pay this bill tomorrow? I said, we don't have the money for it. He paused for a moment. I'll never forget this. And he said to me, Scott, God knows where we are. He said, you know, Scott, he said, God's never failed to help us pay a single bill. He said, I don't think it's going to start tomorrow. <laughs> I said, well, I appreciate that faith, Pastor. <laughs> what would you like me to do tonight? <laughs> He said to me, why don't you do what I'm going to do? I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to go to bed. And he 
he said, we're going to see what the Lord does. Well, he may have gone home and gone to bed. <laughs> I was nervous all night long. I got here the next morning. I went to the finance office, and I said to the lady, I said, I'm, a, I'm going to the post office today. <laughs> she, I'll never forget. Her eyes got dead. She said, you're going to the post office? I said, I'm going to the post office. Tell the folks, I, they don't need to pick up the mail today. I'm picking the mail up today. And I said, I'm going to bring it right here to your office, and you and I will open it together. I went, picked up a tub, what seemed like a whole lot of nothing. Go back to the office and set it down on her desk. I never forget this. She got a letter open, I got a letter open. We're open. $100. Well, thank God for $100, but it ain't okay. Little here, little here, little here, little here. And then I opened an envelope, unmarked, and read these words. Dear sirs. Wasn't even addressed to anyone. Dear sirs. I rejected her for an estate of a lady that knew of your work. She's never been there. She believed in what you're doing, training ministers for the gospel. She asked, that upon her death, a certain percentage, an exact percentage of her estate, be sent to Crown College to further the work of the Lord. And I, I pulled a check out of that envelope. Now, do you know, Pastor, it was for just maybe $300 more than the exact amount of money we needed that day. I grabbed that check. Took off walking through the Heritage Center. You know, there was George Mueller and all those people. I went walking past him shouting. I really did. I even paused in front of Mueller a second and said, You got prayers answered. <laughs> and God started teaching me something that when you think we got nothing, you still got Jesus, don't you? Man's yeah. yeah. said, When you get to the bottom, you find out the foundation is still there. Yeah. And when Jesus is all you have, you find out He's all you need. Amen. They Amen. have how much wine? They have no wine. Oh, but look, please, what Jesus does in verse number seven fill the water pots with water. And they fill them up. Don't you love this expressiveness? To the brim. Can I tell you our God is? Our God is a to the brim God. He's not going to give you enough just to eat by, enough to endure, enough to survive. No. He's going to make it so your cup runs over. He's going to be exceeding abundantly above what he could ask for even think according to his power that works inside of him. He still says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You ever think about how much God knows that you don't know? God says, I'll let you in on it. Do you see how quickly we've moved from no wine in verse 3 to the fullness of verse number 7? Because our God is the God of fullness. Right. If you think I'm talking about stuff and money tonight, I'm talking about what money can't buy and death can't take away from you. Yeah. Before we give you the last one, can I just point one interesting thing out? Go back up to verse number 4. We looked at it a moment ago. When he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. What hour was he talking about? Remember, he's at the beginning of his ministry. It's the first miracle. He's got a lot to do, a lot to teach, a lot of places to go, people to, to talk to. So look, he's on the front of it. The hour he's referring to is referred to over the gospel records is the end of his ministry. That's the hour where it's fully revealed who he is through the death, burial, and resurrection, through the redemptive work that he came to do. So watch this. He's standing on the front saying to her, these people are ready to know what you know. These people are ready to see what you've seen. These people are ready to understand all of my glory. My hour is not yet come. Watch this. But even though that hour was not yet come, Jesus was still willing to work in this hour. I've marked in my Bible in verse 4 the words, not yet. So I said, when's Jesus coming, preacher? I don't know, but not yet. He hadn't come yet. He may come in the next millisecond, but he hadn't come yet. Not, not yet has peace come for this world to come. But not yet has the Lord stepped out of God. Not yet has the, has the shout rang out and the trumpet sounded. Not yet, but oh, I've got some encouragement for you tonight. You don't have to just wait on that hour of his final full forever revelation to see Christ at work because Jesus is willing to work in the hour you're in right now. Yeah. So we come to a third truth. What does God bring out of nothing? He brings blessing out of obedience and bounty out of emptiness. But number three, he brings the best at the end. He 
He always saves the best for last. Isn't that just like Jesus? Yeah. So they draw it out. They bring it to the governor. Look what the governor says in verse number 10. Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men are well drunk, then that which is worse. Yeah, that's what men do. That's not what God does. This world will give you its best up front, and it's all downhill from there. But the Bible says the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth not less and less, but more and more unto the perfect day. I have not seen, you have not heard, it's not entered in the heart of men the things that our God has prepared for them that love Him. I say to you tonight, if you think you've seen some amazing things from the God of grace and glory, you haven't seen anything yet. God always saves the best for I purposely didn't turn on the news driving over tonight, for which I am grateful. <laughs> I don't know what happened today. Frankly, I hate to say this, but I really don't want to know what happened. Can I give you some good news tonight? Here's the good news. You ready? Whatever men are doing today or failing to do, Jesus is still at work, and he's not finished yet. Amen. In the words of Solomon, he makes all things beautiful. In his time. Can I prove it? Hold your place for just a second and run back to the Old Testament book of Isaiah with me for just a minute. I'm almost done, but just, just look with me in Isaiah 61. I got to look at this today. It thrilled my soul. Isaiah 61 is about Messiah coming. Did you know Jesus quoted Isaiah 61 in reference to himself? Look at Isaiah 61, verse 1. See if it doesn't sound vaguely familiar. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn. It's about Christ. Do you remember Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 when he was sent for and said, Are you really the one we're looking for? He quoted this passage. Yes, yes. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here's what I've come to do. Did you ever notice, though, that he did not quote, quote verse 3? Look at what the old radio commentator Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. <laughs> to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. How many of you know there's a lot of mourning in Zion right now? <laughs> to give unto them, you ready? Beauty for ashes. Stop looking at this second. Ashes. The sign of mourning and death. Ashes on the head. God says, there's coming a day. We're going to take away the ashes and we're going to give you beauty. Did you know the word for beauty here is the same word for the glory of God? That's glorious, isn't it? Beauty doesn't just mean God's going to fix you up a little. No, no. You're going to share in the Lord's glory. God's going to put his glow on you someday. Amen. That's not all. That's not all. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. We, we've just gone from the funeral to the wedding right here. From mourning to the oil of joy. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I have no idea what I'm preaching tonight, but I guarantee you in this room, there's some people that came into this meeting tonight. Maybe you've lived all day. Maybe the last few weeks, it's been like a wet blanket on you. The spirit of heaviness on you. You feel almost oppressed. There's a spiritual conflict going on. You're discouraged and despondent and losing hope. Listen to me. God is still at work. Amen. And he's going to bring the best in the end. You better keep your eye on Jesus. Look at it, please. Because he's going to take that spirit of heaviness. He's going to give you a brand new garment. The garment of praise. Isn't that going to be glorious? Yeah. And notice that they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. Now here it is again. It's always his purpose. That he might be glorious. Yeah. We need to stop praying for our comfort. Start praying for his glory. Amen. Relief should never be the primary goal of any believer. Yeah. The glory of God must be. Yeah. God says, I'm going to make you a bunch of trees. The word he uses for trees here is the word for a giant oak, a strong tree. Look, planted and permanent. So maybe the floods have come in. Maybe the winds have blown. Maybe the storm has come through town and blown you all around. I want you to know there's coming a day. God's going to plant you because the Lord always brings his best at the end. You go back with me to John 2 and we'll end here. It is God who brings something out of nothing. And it is. It is God who brings blessing out of obedience and bounty out of emptiness and is best at the end. And I ask you this simple application question tonight, and it is this. What are we supposed to do? 
fact, when I started tonight, I started with a bunch of questions. We, we answered the when and the where and the who and the what and the why. The one question we didn't answer was the how. How do we see God's mighty power? How, how do we see the Lord step in? How do we see the Lord bring good things out of a whole lot of nothing? This is the thing that all these years as I've read this story, I, miss, I just missed it. It was there, it was on the surface. I guess I got it at a glance, but I missed the depth of it, and I can't get away from it. Would you like to know how all those people got wine at the wedding? Would you like to know how all the disciples believed on him? Would you like to know how this first miracle landed in John chapter number 2? Watch this. It was through the faith of one woman. One woman named Mary just believed. Jesus not only could do this, but whatever he did, it would be exactly what needed to be done. That's right. And I'm going to tell you what's missing right now in the churches I'm in across the country. Can I tell you what's missing? <laughs> Faith. Somebody say, we need more preaching. Well, we do need more preaching, but I don't preaching's not missing. Y'all get a lot of preaching around here. We got a lot of preaching. You know what we got though? We got a lot of preaching, not a lot of faith. We got a lot of praying, going through the motions, not a lot of faith. We got a lot of singing, not a lot of faith. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is the victory, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The just shall live by his faith. And I'm going to tell you what God is looking for. You want to see God work? How many would like to see God do some amazing things for His glory at this time of history? Would you raise your hand? I'm going to tell you what He's looking for. He's looking on some, for somebody to just believe Him. Amen. Martin Luther said, God made the world out of nothing. And it is only when we become nothing that God can make something out of us. Amen. Maybe what we need to do is say, God, Lord, we're just nothing. Lord, we got nothing. Nothing. But we believe you can bring something wonderful out of nothing. Our Father, I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. That Jesus alone will be glorified. Heads are bowed and prayerful spirit before the Lord. I think if it's all right tonight, we won't have any music because I'd like, number one, everybody to be able to pray, and number two, the only sound in the room at the moment would be the sound of people talking to God. Let's start here. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? And if He did come tonight, you know you're ready, you know you're saved. Would you lift your hand to God right now? Hold it high. With your hand lifted to heaven, would you thank Him right now for saving you? Just say to the Lord, thank you for not letting me go to hell, Lord. What a wonderful Savior we have. He is a wonderful Savior. Would you lower your hands for a moment? May I ask? I must. Is there someone among us tonight that would say, Preacher, if I died right now, stood before God, or Jesus came tonight, I do not have that kind of assurance. I couldn't raise my hand with confidence a moment ago. I'm not 100 sure I'm ready to go to heaven, but I'm sure of this. I don't want to go to hell. Preacher, pray for me. I need Jesus. I want you to slip your hand in the air of mine right now. Would you please say, pray for me. I need the Lord. God bless you. May I say, if there's someone here tonight without Jesus, in a moment when people come to pray, when we begin our season of prayer, I'm going to stand right here at the front my Bible. And if you're in this room tonight and you're not certain of your soul's salvation, would you simply come and let me speak to you for a moment? I won't embarrass you. I won't put you on the spot. But I want to tell you the Bible tonight how you can have your sins forgiven. How you can be saved. Would you like to be saved? I must ask this question. Is there a Christian here tonight that would say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I'm like exactly what you were talking about a while ago. My heart is backslidden and cold and indifferent. Things are not right in my heart between me and God. And the Holy Spirit has convicted me of that tonight. And I want to get right with God as a Christian. Pray for me. I want you to raise your hand in the air with mine right now. Would you please? Yes, God bless you. God bless you. 
May I ask a second question? How many Christians in the room tonight would say, Brother Scott, when you were talking a moment ago about whatsoever, what is it God has spoken to you about? How many people in this room would say, the Holy Spirit put his finger on something in my life, something in my life that needs to be cared for, that I must obey God and pray for me? I want you to raise your hand and sign right here, would you please? I want all of you, and I mean this, all of you that just raised your hand that you either need to get right with the Lord or obey him in some area, if you mean it, and only if you mean it, I want you to stand to your feet right where you are right now. Just stand up right where you are. You say, God's speaking to me. I'm a Christian. But there's some things I need to get right with the Lord. There's something I need to obey God in that I've not yet obeyed the Lord in. God has my attention. If you're standing, I'd like you to look at me right now, would you please? The folks seated don't know it, but I'm getting ready to ask all of them to join me in a special season of prayer. But I want to ask you to take action on whatever that thing is God has spoken to you about tonight. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able. If you're not physically able, pray right where you are. But if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to come and join me in this old-fashioned altar and find a place to tell God what you just told me. If you can, would you leave your place right now and just come find your place of prayer? Say to the Lord tonight, Lord, I'm saved and I'm grateful to be saved. If you're speaking to me, I want to be right and I want to be clean and I want to be obedient. God bless you. Would you be as specific with God as God is being with you right now? Be specific with God right now. Call it by name. Agree with the Lord. Say yes to Oh, Holy Spirit, do a thorough work among us. Leave no stone unturned in our hearts. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Dear God, I want to be right. I want to leave right. that knoweth to do good and doeth it not into sin. Lord God, forgive us of our sin. And before we go any further in this prayer, would you do something? Before you finish your prayer, would you do something right now? Would you go ahead and settle? What's the next step in that? It's more. It's got to be more than just a prayer. What's next? Is there somebody you need to go to to make something right? Phone call you need to make? Somebody you need to go to this week and witness to? We've been putting it off? What is it? What's the thing? A time alone with God before we go to bed tonight or in the morning? What is the thing? Go ahead and settle it right now. Ask the Lord, Lord, show me what to do. And I'll just do it. Whatever you say to me, I'll do it. Oh, God, give wisdom now from us. May there be spiritual action. Here's where we're going to close the prayer tonight. I'm speaking to every person in the room. I'm speaking to you if you're kneeling at the altar. I'm speaking to you if you're standing or sitting in the auditorium. Here is, here is what we're going to pray about tonight. I want us tonight, in just a moment, I want every believer that's here to find another Christian to pray with. But before you do it, I want you to listen to me. Hear me out in just a moment. You say, why? I want you to share with somebody something you're trusting God to do. Is there someone on your heart tonight? Is there something you can't change, but God can? What is the thing? Who is the person? What you share is between you and God and you and that person. But I'm going to ask you to be specific tonight. And then I'm going to ask the two of you to have a season of prayer together. One of you can open the prayer. The other one can close the prayer. But I'm going to ask both of you to pray. Pray for each other by name. Pray for each other's need by name. Do you believe, church, do you believe that we could be in here praying and 100 miles from here, God could be answering prayers. Do you believe that? Do you believe we could pray in here tonight and out of this prayer meeting, God could bring some things this week into churches and homes and communities that we'd all just have to stand back and say, God did that. I believe that. I'm going to ask you tonight to pray in faith. Right now, quickly, reverently, quietly, all over the building, I want to ask everybody to find a prayer partner. Right now, would you please? If you're in the altar, just lean over next to somebody. Ladies, find another lady. Men, find another man. 
You're seated. Look around. Make sure nobody's alone. If somebody's across the aisle by themselves, just look over to them. Ask them to join you. Let's make sure everybody's got somebody to pray with. Amen. I'm going to be right here. Somebody needs to come talk and pray. For the next few moments, let's just make this a house of prayer. Share something definite with someone. Let's spend a few moments talking to God. Yes, Lord, we are needy people. And we have done. But I think you have more than enough. We lay hold tonight on that promise that your grace is sufficient for us, that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I pray, oh God, that all over this room, faith will grow in the hearts of men and women and young people. The word will bring faith. And I ask, Lord, that there will be definite answers to prayer and definite obedience to grow out of this book. And I give you praise for it. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I'm going to let you have a seat for just a moment. I tell you what, let's all stay. You've been sitting for a while. <laughs> Would you look this way before the pastor comes? I want to thank you for the way you listen to me, and I want to thank you for the way you respond to the Word of God. It's so refreshing. How many of you have some need you're trusting God for tonight? Amen. All right, so watch this. Don't just pray about it in here. Pray your way home tonight. Pray your way to sleep tonight. Before you get out of bed in the morning, stretch yourself out of your bed and make sure you get an altar, and pray your way into the new day tomorrow. And I'm telling you, if you'll be a Mary, you'll just believe the Lord. We're going to see the Lord do some amazing things. Drive over here tonight. I got a message about someone I preached in a church months ago. A young man came to me and he said, Would you pray for me? He said, I have a family that is lost at these Jesus. Would you pray for his salvation? I remember the young man. You're our ticket, young man. And we prayed together. And I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I haven't thought much about that since that meeting. 
And I got a message from him tonight. He said, you, you don't remember me, but I am. He told me, and I remember. He said, I just want you to know God's answered our prayer. Amen. And that love will just trust in Christ as he said he does. And I was reminded again, God really can bring something out of nothing. I wrote a little card with me tonight. I only want you to take it really one or two things with it. Uh, we had planned this meeting last year. I think maybe I told you about it, a gospel meeting. And we had to move it because of the pandemic. In that point, uh, just a couple hours from here, there are 40 independent Baptist churches working together. How I many of you know that's a miracle of the grace of God? <laughs> and they all been, they've been working at it for two years. They have rented the convention center in Beckley. And we're having a God Bless America rally. It's a gospel meeting uh, on 9-11 weekend. Did you know this year's the 20th anniversary of 9-11? Yeah. Can you believe that? 20 years. So we're, we're at that, that time. And there's a little card on the table on the left-hand side of your way out tonight. I, I would like you to take it and you'll do one of two things. And all that I have with me are there. Uh, if, you, if you don't get one, you can go to our website and we'll be announcing more information about it. Number one, if you'll pray. There's going to be a lot of lost people come, God willing, and each night I'm just going to preach on Jesus. Yeah. And we're praying for the salvation of the lost. Yeah. And so if you'll help me pray, use this as a prayer reminder, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, several of you may be interested in coming. It's not a long drive. I had a pastor the other day who was a couple hours away from us and said, we're bringing a group of our people. We want them to see this and be a part of it. And you may want to bring a group of people over. And so if you want information, it has the dates on it. On this, it says Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, September 10, 11, 12, 7 o'clock each night. That is accurate. Just so you're, you'll know if you're interested in coming, we're actually starting on Thursday night with all the church people. The Thursday night will be the convention center, same time, 7 o'clock. And it'll be like a revival meeting. Because we, we don't think it's right for us to preach for lost people to be saved until God's people are thoroughly right. Yeah, and so that night will be a meeting like this, a prayer meeting. And uh, I, I would like to encourage some of you who really like to labor with us in the gospel effort, come over. But if you can be there Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, how many of you know somebody that needs to be saved? You know, there are people that will never come to a church service like this that wouldn't come to a special God bless America rally at a neutral site like that if you could hear the gospel. Why don't you load up in your car and drive over the mountain and bring them to, you know, feed them dinner, be nice to them, and then bring them to the meeting. And let's pray together that we see some people saved. Wouldn't that be glorious? Amen. If you could help us that way, grab a card on your way out. Pastor, thank you for letting me be here. Is that good? Amen. Well, you ought to be able to have an overflowing cup right now to take home with you. And I hope to see you back on next Tuesday as well. We pray for Brother Scott and all these things that he's involved in. And uh, he has a very moving ministry and doing an awful lot for the Lord. And uh, I just thank God that uh, I met him some years ago and, and have become hopefully good friends with one another that we can fellowship with one another. And uh, I know he, he prayed, he and his wife prayed for Gwen, and, uh, and I appreciate that so very much. So uh, we're going to be dismissed, and uh, I'm going to let you just go ahead and go. Uh, we've had a great time shake hands with one another and uh, rejoice in the goodness of God and be saved going home. Yeah. God bless you.